Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, last session for this morning of the final day of Linux Conf AU 2017. Um, this presentation is by Vanessa Teague of the University of Melbourne, and she will be discussing Australian election software. Please make her welcome. Okay, I'm truly a cryptographer, but this is not a talk about cryptography. This talk is mostly focused around getting people to think about what it means for an election to be secure if part of the election is conducted using computers. The work in this talk is part of a vast international conspiracy of election integrity advocates, computer scientists and statisticians. Everybody who's contributed directly is listed here. The subtitle obviously is deliberately provocative. It says, if we didn't notice anything wrong, does that mean that the election outcome is right? Good, I'm glad people are laughing because obviously it doesn't. We're going to talk a little bit about how we might get evidence that the election outcome is okay. So, hands up if you're from Australia or New Zealand. Hands up if pictures like this make you feel smug. <laughs> a few hands, all right, excellent. I've got 40 minutes to go and I'm going to keep polling on that question throughout the talk. Because actually in Australia we use a lot of software. We use software for encoding and counting preferential votes in the Senate and in most of the upper houses of most of the states that you live in. We use software for voting in a polling place in the ACT, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and West Australia. Some of these are only for limited classes of electors like uh, people who can't see a paper ballot clearly, but some of them are quite widespread. We use software for voting over the internet in New South Wales. And if you're in Western Australia, it's coming to you soon and perhaps also in Victoria. How would we know if the software was correct? How do we know whether it was secure? Does it keep the votes private? Does it give us the outcome that the voters actually chose? How would we know? It's obvious, at least I hope it's obvious to this kind of crowd, that making the source code open is a critical <coughs> first step. But I'm not going to beat that particular drum today because I assume that's kind of red. What I actually want to say is it's not sufficient either. Let's think hard about what it really means for an election to be conducted securely in the context of it being partly conducted over a computer. Because even if I've carefully examined the source code of whatever system you're now using, I don't necessarily know that that was what was running on the computers on the day. I don't necessarily know that whatever that system output wasn't fiddled on the way into the count. Uh, I don't necessarily know that it isn't buggy even if I've had a chance to look at it and so forth. This isn't a new set of questions. This is actually an ancient set of questions. The humble paper or cardboard Australian ballot box, if you think about it, this is a carefully engineered design that was deliberately constructed by some clever people in response to a serious security problem. Back at the end of the 19th century, it used to be that you would bring your own paper ballot into a polling place. And you could cut them out of the newspaper or you could get them from a political party and people could see which piece of paper you were taking in to the polling booth. This gave them the opportunity to encourage you to take a different piece of paper into the polling booth if that was the way that they wanted you to vote instead. So this idea that seems totally natural to us, that you walk into a polling booth and, you, and every voter gets a standardised government issued piece of paper on which they express their intention, is in fact a specific design choice that was deliberately made more than 100 years ago and adopted first in Australia and later spread throughout the rest of the world where it's still called the Australian ballot. So this little ceremony we have where you get a private opportunity to vote and then you put your piece of paper in that cardboard box and then the scrutineers watch the count happen is a carefully engineered process for letting you vote in private and then letting the scrutineers watch a public process in which they get evidence that the election is properly conducted. It's not the only way to do it. Uh, not every country uses the Australian ballot. Uh, in France, their uh, 
voting boxes are literally transparent. It's called an electoral urn. And people, different, people voting for different parties vote on different coloured pieces of paper. They solve the privacy problem by putting their different coloured pieces of paper into identical little blue envelopes. And then they put their little blue envelope into a glass box. And then same thing at the end of the election, everybody stands around and watches the officials open the glass box and open the envelopes and count the votes. Right? So there's nothing special about the particular way we do it, but there's something very cleverly engineered about allowing people to vote in private, but producing a public process that shows evidence that the count is done properly. There's nothing magical about paper. These are voting discs for jury decisions from the Athenian Agora more than 2,000 years ago. Um, people voted guilty or innocent based on putting one of these little bronze discs in an urn. And there are actually two different kinds of bronze discs. One is full through the middle, and the other has a little hole in the middle. You can't tell, but that's the whole point. You can't tell from a distance whether the voter is putting the guilty vote or the innocent vote into the urn. But you can see that everybody only drops one vote into the urn and you can watch a public process of counting them after the fact. So far, so good. So there's nothing magical about paper, but there's something clever about private votes and public evidence. The United States has been struggling with this, as with many other electoral issues, for a long time. A lot of American elections are counted on computers. And a lot of American computer scientists and statisticians have fought back. These are two of the best of them. This is Ron Rivest and Philip Stark conducting a risk-limiting audit of the paper votes that have been electronically counted in an American election. So even though most of the votes are counted on paper, they're conducting a rigorous, randomised statistical audit to go back and check the paper evidence of how pe check a sample of the paper evidence of how people voted and see whether or not that matches the official election result. So there are lots of different ways of turning a private vote into a publicly available piece of evidence about how people intended to vote. I'm going to talk about four case studies from Australia, some of them better and some of them worse. The first one is my, in some ways my project, but in some ways Craig Burton's project and in some ways Chris Cullnane's project. It was a project, an open source project designed around a cryptographically verifiable voting system where people would vote in a supervised polling place in the state of Victoria. My second example is a not open source, not verifiable project for voting over the internet, which has run in New South Wales and will soon run in West Australia. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about vote counting software, first in New South Wales and then in the Senate. Many of you know parts of this story, but I hope everybody learned something they didn't know already. All right. The Victorian project, you can still get the source code off the web if you like, is a cryptographic end-to-end -end verifiable election system designed to solve the following problem. There are a lot of Australian expatriates and they live in places like London and New York and Hong Kong and San Francisco where they want to vote. We could post them a paper ballot, but it's a complete pain in the neck and it's not a particularly secure process. This system is designed to allow them to vote in a secure way from a protected and supervised polling place in an embassy in London or Hong Kong or wherever. It took 1,121 votes, most of them from the Australian High Commission in London. The idea is that you generate, during your private voting experience, an encrypted receipt of how you voted. It looks like this. And you get evidence when you're in the private polling place that this vote accurately reflects your intention. I haven't got time to explain why, but I've got a link to the paper. You can have a look. Then you walk out of the polling place with this receipt. It doesn't show anybody how you voted because it's encrypted. You can see your preference numbers, but you can't see what they mean. And then you check later after that vote is uploaded to the server and after the election outcome is announced, the Electoral Commission produces the complete list of all the encrypted votes that it received. You can check that yours is in the list 
and you can check a mathematical proof that all of the encrypted votes were properly shuffled and decrypted. The scrutineers still have to check that the right output goes into the count. I could talk about this all day. I'm not going to because I've got three other things to talk about. That's the first reason. Um, but if you're interested in looking at the details, the right questions to ask are, hang on a minute, I don't trust this software. How do I know that my vote was cast in the way that I intended? How did I know that it was properly included in the count? And how do the scrutineers get to check that all of the votes that were included were properly decrypted and tallied? And the answer is, there are good answers to all of these questions and you can read about them in this uh, long and careful paper in archive. Or you can have a look at the source code which is up on Bitbucket. So vVote really and truly belongs in the collection of carefully engineered things which carefully derive a public evidence trail of the right election result from individual private votes. You could argue about the design trade-offs we made because there are always choices to make between doing a really good job of privacy, doing a really sound job of verifiability, making it simple, making it easy to use. You could argue about the design choices we made, and many people did, but in some ways that's the whole point, right? We should be having an argument about the design choices based on a completely open design. The main reason I'm not going to talk about it anymore is it's not going to run again. The Victorian Electoral Commission just didn't get it, didn't deal with it, and doesn't want to do it anymore. And I guess for those of you who saw Dan Callahan's talk about persona, I feel a little bit the same way. Right? I really feel that this was the right way forward. Even if you don't agree with particular individual design choices, the idea that there should be an Australian-owned, Australian-designed, open-source, verifiable voting system that runs in a polling place and guarantees vote privacy, that seems like a step on the right path. And I think we have to admit that that project is, at least at the moment, not going to happen anymore, and we have to think hard about why. And I think, that I, I think really the answer about why is that we didn't get the electoral commissions on board. They didn't understand what it was for. They didn't understand why it was good. It was clunky, right? It was, it was very much a project run with a focus on integrity, and it wasn't a slick, easy-to-use, plug-and-play kind of straightforward thing at all. They found it hard, they found it clunky, they didn't understand it. They were frightened by the security analysis because we would go to them and say, look, here is, the set of thing, here is the set of things which, when compromised, can violate ballot privacy. Because right? that's what cryptographers and computer scientists do. You, they, you write out a clear statement of the attacker model and under what circumstances certain things can go wrong. That frightened them. <laughs> to me, that's honesty. To them, that's just scary. What they want to do instead is buy a closed source, not verifiable voting system that runs over the internet because that comes with a lovely little pamphlet that says it's been certified to be perfectly secure and correct and nothing can go wrong. <laughs> um, and this kind of makes me cry, to be honest. When I saw Dan crying about Persona, I thought, yeah, I could kind of cry about this too. Maybe some of you will also be crying by the end of the talk. All right, let's talk about New South Wales. The iVote architecture works like this. It took 280,000 votes over the internet in the 2015 New South Wales state election. Uh, for those of you who need a bit of perspective on that, there are about four and a half million total voters in New South Wales. So this is a large fraction of the overall vote, uh, five or six percent, quite enough to affect a close election outcome. It happened to be not a close election outcome, but that's sheer good luck. So here's how it works. You vote on your own device of your choosing. The vote is sent over, uh, the vote is encrypted on the device and then sent over TLS to the um, Electoral Commission server. It gives you a receipt number, not an encrypted receipt of your vote, just a number that's more or less randomly generated at the time. It exports a list of votes to an independent third party called a verification service. And you can telephone that service, tell them your receipt number, and ask them to read back your vote to you. 
Brilliant. And then they announce the election outcome and that's it. There's some kind of an auditing process of somebody is supposed to reconcile the votes that were verified with the votes that were on the Electoral Commission server. I've never understood that process. I don't think anybody else does either. So, a few days into polling, we were looking at the practice version of the site and we discovered that it was pulling JavaScript code in, not from the main election server, but from a third party analytics provider, because naturally that's what you need in a secure voting session. Unfortunately, the third party analytics provider had configured their TLS service to serve up, among other things that would have been more secure, uh, export grade RSA and Diffie-Hellman parameters for TLS. So Alex Helderman, mostly Alex Helderman with a little bit of help from me, wrote up a nice little demonstration of how if you were anywhere between the third party analytics provider and the totally secure voting session, you could intercept the JavaScript code uh, after having broken the export grade crypto, intercept the JavaScript code, substitute your own JavaScript code, and then do whatever you like. For example, expose how the person wanted to vote, substitute a different vote, change the verification instructions, and muck around with their receipt number so that they couldn't even call in to verify the completely different vote that you'd submitted on their behalf. We notified CERT, CERT, made the electoral, CERT notified the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Commission fixed it, but that was uh, after, according to the ABC, about 66,000 votes were cast while the system was vulnerable. Now, of course we don't know how, we don't know how many instances of voting were at, whether anybody nasty actually did anything nasty with this or any other vulnerability. We didn't have any particular reason to believe that anybody else had known about it and had exploited it, but then we didn't have any particular reason to believe not either. I hope it's clear from the protocol picture from a few slides ago, the system really isn't verifiable. Right? You're really not getting any kind of evidence about the integrity of the election result from this cutesy little process where you get to telephone in and have your vote read back to you. You're getting your privacy broken for basically no evidence about whether or not the election outcome was right. Oh, we read that bit already. We do know that about 5,000 people called into that service and successfully retrieved a vote. What does that tell us? Well, strictly nothing, because the verification process wasn't even sound. But if it had been sound, and there are some internet voting protocols that do give you genuine evidence, a genuine opportunity to check that the right vote has gone in on your behalf, even if it had been sound, it's not the total number of successes that give you the, that's the important statistic, it's the rate of failure Right. So let's just assume for the sake of argument that we have some trust in iVote's verification process. I don't, but we want to get some kind of an estimate, and this is the only estimate we're going to get of the extent of the failures. How, we, we, we were told 5,000 people successfully verified. We need to know how many tried to verify but failed. And note that because, this, because it was easy to interfere with the receipt number and because you needed the receipt number to retrieve your vote, a failure could be either you successfully logged in and retrieved the vote that wasn't what you expected, or you tried to log in but you realised that your receipt number didn't retrieve for you any meaningful vote. So we need to take the total of both of those kinds of failures, figure out the rate of error, and then use that rate of error as an estimate of the total number of failures in the voting process. It's not a very good estimate for a whole variety of reasons, right? Because it could be that the verification mechanism failed but the votes are okay. It could be that the right votes are on the verification service but the wrong votes are on the main voting server. It could be that actually the whole system is fine but the person forgot their receipt number. We don't really know exactly what happened. But the only estimate that we can get of the rate of failure is to take the number who tried to verify but failed 
divide it by the number who successfully verified and extrapolate that failure rate to the whole 280,000 I votes. So let's try and do that. Remember the election was in March of 2015. At the time, the Electoral Commission put up on their website the following statement. They said 1.7% of electors who voted using iVote also used the verification service. None of them identified any anomalies with their vote. And I thought, okay, okay, fair enough. Because although I could think of a lot of ways of an attacker interfering with both the voting and the verification process, I actually couldn't think of any ways where you'd get absolutely no anomalies. So I thought, okay, okay, fine. Maybe they were lucky, good for them. And then I thought about it a little bit more and I thought, hang on, 1.7% is 5,000 people. You're telling me 5,000 people each remembered not only a six-digit ID number, but a 12-digit receipt number, and everybody got that exactly right. I don't believe that. So I asked at a seminar at Melbourne Uni, a representative of the New South Wales Electoral Commission, I said, OK, OK, how many tried to verify but couldn't retrieve any vote? And he said, ah, oh, I was in the tens. Note that this is October 2015, which is long after the period when anybody who wanted to challenge the election result has expired under law. Okay, and again I thought, okay, it was in the tens, that's actually not very many. Okay. It's not none, but it's not very many. There are official parliamentary processes for examining the election um, run in New South Wales. Parliamentarians asked the same person, how many people failed to verify? He said, we had seven people hit the button after verifying their vote to say that it was not as they cast it. We telephoned two of them and they said that wasn't what they meant to do. Now, don't think about privacy, okay? Just don't think about privacy at all. Don't ask how they managed to telephone two of them. <laughs> Just think about the arithmetic, because that's seven, maybe minus two. I call that five, which is not none, not in the tens. Curiouser and curiouser. So the chair of the committee, half an hour later, said, but how many people tried to verify, failed to retrieve any vote? And the same person said, oh, that, oh, that, that was 627. <laughs> 62 tens, which is sort of in the tens. <laughs> Note that this is more than a year after the election, and this is the first we've heard about it. I call that 10%. And given all the caveats that I said before about it not necessarily being very accurate, it could be a, an overestimate, it could be an underestimate of the true failure rate of that integrity of the voting process, I thought 10% was a fair thing to say, especially since, to be honest, it's really more like 12%, but who's counting? The New South Wales Electoral Commission took great exception to my taking 627 dividing by 5,000 and calling that 10%, uh, and they wrote a very rude, quite recent, federal parliamentary submission about uh, internet voting and what a wonderful thing it is. They said, it is believed that those 627 calls were made by approximately 200 unique voters. As a trained scientist, I have to, to love the use of the passive voice here. It is believed by nobody particularly <laughs> specified. Not by me, that's for sure. All right. All we really know is that the election outcome wasn't verifiable. It's really hard to say anything else with any kind of confidence. We have some kind of an indication that indicates a failure rate of about 10%. We have no idea how accurate, that, how accurate that is. We do know that at least one seat in the Legislative Council was decided by a much smaller margin than that indicated error. And it doesn't really matter whether you call it 627 or 200 or 300. Uh, the fraction of I votes that it would have taken to change that seat is... Um, only a little over 1%. Now, verification is a logical process. If the logical steps aren't sound, the outcome might be wrong and you might just not know. We know there was a security problem. We don't know whether it was exploited. We don't know whether it changed an election outcome or not. And I think it's the not knowing that is really just unforgivable. Uh, if you're a West Australian voter, come and talk to me afterwards because this is going to run in your state election in April, March or April of this year. So, who, f who still feels smug? Hands up, hands up, no. Not even any New Zealanders who feel a little bit smug? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. 
All right, so enough about voting. I hope it's clear now why I think it's really sad that V-Vote has died and I-Vote is being more and more widely adopted. Now we're going to talk about counting software. Now, most people are already from Australia or New Zealand. If you're not, you need to know that Australian vote counting is hideously and magnificently complicated. Most Australians don't understand how it works. Australians write a series of preferences into a larger ballot that lists all of their different candidates. And then there's a very complex algorithm for assigning multiple seats at once in a proportional way based on the, all of the preferences that people have expressed. Most of this is done in software. Even if you are Australian, you might not know that New South Wales Legislative Council voting is a lot like the standard Senate voting, but it has an entertaining twist. In the single transferable vote method that we all use, you often reach a point where a certain candidate has got more than the quota that they need to get a seat. When that happens, you've got an excess vote. Let's say, let's say that the, this person has twice as much of the, twice as many votes as they need to get a seat. We redistribute their excess vote, which is, let's say, a quota's worth, to all of the next preferences on the subsequent slots down their ballot. In the Senate and in Victoria and the ACT, they do this in a deterministic way. They just redo the weights of the individual votes. Let's say they halve them if there's double the number that the person needs. And then they redistribute all of the votes with that reduced weight, which is good. In New South Wales, they choose half of them at random in software <laughs> for which the source code is not available. <laughs> However, there's lots of data available because they use the same source code not only for counting the Legislative Council, but also for counting the vast number of different local government elections that are run throughout New South Wales every four years. Andrew Conway re-implemented the algorithm to investigate the effects of randomness because I was interested to know in the context of that very close Legislative Council count in the 2015 state election whether or not if we'd run it a hundred times we would have got different answers. Uh, we didn't. But when we ran the local government results from 2012, a few thousand times, we got lots of different answers. In particular, we found not only that the randomness can make a big difference, even if the count is accurate, but also that there was a serious bug in the code that implemented the count. And that bug affected the probability distributions of who deserved to win, and we could see one particular candidate in the seat of Griffith, sorry, in the local council of Griffith, who should have won with more than 90% probability, but for whom the bug in the software had incorrectly lowered her probability of winning well below, um, I think it was below 10%. She didn't win. She should have won with more than 90% uh, likelihood. But hey, that was 2012. We didn't notice until 2016. It was all done and dusted. Tough luck. We talked to the Electoral Commission about it. They were actually very civilised about it um, and said thank you. We recommended opening the source code and generating the random seed publicly. Now, if you think about the importance of opening the source code for elections, there are probably a number of reasons that are completely obvious to everybody in the room. Right? It's, just good, it's a good look for electoral transparency. It's a good opportunity for interested outsiders to find and correct bugs before they muck up an election. But in the case of the random count in New South Wales, there's a third, even more compelling reason to make the source code open, which is that that's the only way I can think of to, of doing a transparent job of showing that you've generated those random selections properly. So what they should be doing, which is what Philip Stark does for his risk limiting audits, is make the source code open, set it up in such a way that anybody can run it, and then generate the random seed any way you like that shows that you couldn't have manipulated it. You know, roll some dice, use last night's Tats Lotto numbers. It almost doesn't matter as long as you make a public demonstration of how you did it and then you let anybody else run the deterministic part of the software to make those pseudo-random selections and everybody can see that the pseudo-random software-based choices have been properly made. Guess what? They didn't. 
and it was urgent, right? Because we figured this out in early 2016, and they're running uh, local government elections in September of 2016. In the 2016 local government count, Andrew found two more bugs. Again, based on the data, not the code, we couldn't think of a specific way that they'd made it a difference to a particular election outcome, but it's not really clear. There was one more candidate who should have won with 54% probability, but didn't. Again, that doesn't prove that there was a mistake, but it shows that there should have been some kind of a transparent process for demonstrating that there wasn't a mistake. I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> so, let's talk about the Senate. Who already knows about, who has already thought about trying to get the Senate counting code? Oh, everybody knows. Okay, good, good. I'm glad you already know. I've got a little slide on it just for those who don't know. Uh, okay, the Senate count is fundamental to the integrity of our democracy. You know, New South Wales local government is one thing, the Senate is another thing. Obviously, the code should be open. Uh, of course, it isn't. Oh, I just pressed the wrong button. Sorry, how annoying. I got overexcited and crashed my computer. Well, you can see who I'm going to talk about anyway. <laughs> it is just completely stuffed, isn't it? It showed up on the slide Did I? Ah, here. There we go. Okay. Uh, it isn't. Uh, the AAC has after many years of battling with Michael, refused to reveal the source code. I chose this particular article for the security through obscurity argument, um, which, in their defence, they had dropped by the time they actually got to court and substituted with an almost equally funny argument about how the tremendous commercial value of this software was so much more important than making sure they got it right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, tens of dollars. Um, of course, it's not good enough just to ignore expert advice like this. It's important to go personally after the uh, expert and get him declared a vexatious applicant to make sure that he doesn't do it again. Uh, many of you already know this much of the story. You may not know that in just before the 2016 federal election, the Electoral Commission purchased a brand new Senate counting system just to prove how critically important, of that, just to prove what great commercial value the old one had had. Um, they only paid $1.8 million for it, which was a bargain considering how much it would have cost to download one of the many freely available open source versions that are out there on the web. But they really needed to get a secure and correct version, so they bought it from the same company that had implemented iVote. I'm not making this up. You can go and look on Oztender. Um, I think enough said about that, really. If you think about it hard, and I have, I think you'll realise that the Senate counting code is actually the least of our worries. You can redo the Senate count yourself. So in some sense, we're not trusting the code that counts the Senate. Uh, any bugs in that code will probably become evident in much the same way that the bugs in the New South Wales code have become evident even though the source code is not available. Now, the AEC has chosen to set it up so that they become evident at or around election time rather than in advance, but who's that going to hurt? Not me. The Electoral Commission does publish the complete list of all of the data about how everybody voted. More than enough information to redo the count yourself. So that looks great, right? That looks great. But what about the software for digitising all those ballots? I voted on paper. Where's my vote? And how can I be sure that it was accurately digitised? If that software was buggy, insecure, misconfigured, or just plain inaccurate, how would we know? And the answer is only by having a rigorous statistical process of going back and auditing the paper ballots that this data is supposed to be an accurate representation of. 
In this, believe it or not, we can learn from the Americans. Because they've done battle for so long with dodgy software corporations <laughs> pretending to run their elections while actually promising to deliver votes to the Republican Party, there's a whole community and a whole intellectual history of careful auditing of the paper evidence. This shows two of my favourite people in the whole world, Ron Rivest and Philip Stark, auditing an American election. We found out in the most recent election that audits of paper ballots don't happen as often as they should, which is somebody else's sad story. But at least in the case of American voting techniques, we have the statistical and practical techniques available to do those kinds of audits very rigorously. So what can we do in Australia? Ah, sorry, we can press down instead of up. Actually, it turns out to be really hard. This talk could have been a talk in which I inflicted upon you all of the careful mathematical detail in this paper. Instead, you get the link and you're welcome to go and look it up. It turns out that auditing the Australian Senate is a lot more complicated than auditing American voting for the simple reason that the Australian Senate count and Australian Senate votes are both a lot more complicated than individual American votes. So Americans are just voting for their favourite candidate, there's a particular winner, they won by a certain amount which is obvious and then you can do fancy statistics to figure out whether you've done a good enough sample to get enough confidence that you got the right answer. We can't even figure out how to compute the winning margin. Right? Because even if you get to the end and the very last step of the process and you can see that somebody won by a certain number of votes, it's really hard to compute your way through the entire collection of exponentially many, sorry, factorially many different possible alternative um, elimination orders and see whether there was a little tweak that you could have done way earlier in the count that would have given you a completely different answer. We have been trying, we haven't completely solved the problem. Uh, it's NP hard in general. So, we coded up a variety of best effort options. Um, one based in Australia around a bunch of ideas, partly from me and partly from a whole lot of other people at Melbourne Uni about trying to compute electoral margins. Um, meanwhile, the MIT team led by Ron Rivest worked through a technique based on Bayesian audits. After a couple of weeks of us working along in parallel, I cleverly figured out that Ron's approach was much better. <laughs> Although both, uh, both versions are coded up and in the paper, the Bayesian audit approach is really the way to go. But I'm really keenly aware of VVote having failed. Right? VVote was the way to go, but the project didn't work. This has to work, right? We, we cannot have our Senate count electronic and unscrutinisable. This has to work. At the moment, the maths is pretty good, but it's not the slick, easy to use product that it needs to be to get the electoral commissions to actually use it. And it's an inherently difficult problem because going out and fishing out the paper ballots is a pain in the neck. Even if the UI is absolutely beautiful, somebody is still going to have to go and find those ballots and retrieve them and compare them against the data that's in the file. And there's no getting away from that. That's going to be hard. So uh, please take a photo of where all the code is. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, and to get contributions from anybody who'd like to help, but, but especially from people who have an understanding of what I don't know anything about, which is how the actual process of trying to scrutiny the Senate really works and how we could join the nifty maths for doing the audit into a nice UI that would make this, that scrutineers could really run that they could actually use to do the right thing. And with that, I will switch over to questions. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, questions, please, and in the form of a question. If it is not in the form of a question, I will cut you off. Uh, 
Is there any um, use of blockchain to provide the evidence chain? Would that be of value? Because I know it's been suggested on occasions. So a blockchain gives you a public ledger that's secure under a certain set of assumptions. If you go and look at the code for the VVOTE project, oh, if you go and look at the code for the VVOTE project, we implemented a public ledger of votes. And it was designed around, I guess, really old-fashioned ideas of distributed computing. It's, it's really just a, it's two things. It's a distributed consensus protocol with five participants, along with a proof that um, at least two of them have to misbehave in order to foul up the consensus. But then the actual transcript is as simple as it could be. It's just a transcript with a hash, and the hash was published in the newspaper. If you want to check that the transcript you see on the web is consistent with the hash you saw on the newspaper, then you download it and redo the hash. So it doesn't use a blockchain as such, but it does what I think, it does the part that I think everybody who thinks that blockchains will solve the problem of election conduct thinks that blockchains ought to do. Hi, um, thanks for your talk and, um, and thanks for the work that you do as well because I'm so glad that there are people out there like you and your colleagues that are working on this kind of software. Um, because the problem seems to, well, it seems like you're solving that problem. Like we know how to fix um, verifiable voting, like with VVOTE, right? However, our electoral commissions aren't going to use that, which sounds insane, and we're spending $1.8 million building another system rather than, as you say, downloading an open source version. So the problem seems to me to be that our public institutions aren't going to use that stuff, and so my question is that how can we um, like as this kind of community of um, technology professionals, people that know this stuff, how can we solve that? How can we get our governments to like not spend $1.8 million and just download some open source code? Um, that seems to be the problem that we need to solve. How, do you have any ideas how we can do that? That was my question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I've been trying, I haven't succeeded. Um, uh, the, my colleagues in the United States have made progress, 75% of Americans voted on, 75% uh, of Americans saw a paper record of how they voted and there are one or two states that have risk limiting audits. There's a, pro there's a great project going in the United States called Star Vote, which again is going to be an open source verifiable project with a great quantity of um, real evidence that it gets the right answer. They're struggling to find funding over there as well. Um, I don't know the answer to the question. And last question. Hi. Um, so recently in New South Wales, there was a by-election in Orange uh, over which the result was decided by an extremely small um, number of votes. I was wondering if you knew of that election, whether or not this software was in use, and when we may get to see some results on the error rate, and whether or not that error rate was high enough to affect the potential outcome. Um, oh. When we're talking number of votes, I think the, the deciding was about 90. Wow, okay, that's fascinating. So this is a by-election for the state parliament? Yes. Is that right? Uh, huh. I, don't, I didn't know anything about that. When was that? Uh, two months ago. Two months ago. Okay, no, I don't know anything about that. Um, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. I'll try to figure it out. Please thank Vanessa. Thank you.